And good afternoon, everyone. And can I just say thank you so much for hosting me and our ministerial team that's here today. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, before I begin, can I just acknowledge Ray Smith and say, Ray, a fantastic haircut, and thank you for the great job that you're doing uh, at MPI. Uh, can I acknowledge my ministerial colleagues that are here and just say thank you, team, for how hard you're working, because I know uh, we've got a lot to do to turn this country around, but you're working incredibly hard. Uh, and I just want to acknowledge British High Commissioner Iona Thomas. It's great to see you here. You're here every year. We appreciate that. And we have some great mayors in the house as well. So we've got uh, Jackie Church, Susan O'Regan, I saw Grant Smith, and also Paula Southgate are here. So thank you for what you do in local government and local public service as well. Look, today I wanted to talk about the government's vision uh, for this decade and beyond, and actually the crucial role that the primary sector is going to play in that vision as our country's major export earner. First, let me set the scene for that long-term vision. And the reality is that over just two weeks ago, we delivered our first budget, and that budget made good on our promises to cut wasteful spending, to deliver tax relief, to invest in infrastructure, and to improve frontline public services, particularly in the areas of health, education, law and order. The budget was also about restoring fiscal discipline by closing the gap between revenue and expenditure and setting a very credible pathway back to surplus to pay down the country's ballooning debt. The budget delivered more than 240 savings initiatives to help fund tax relief, and the $3.2 billion allowance, budget allowance represents the smallest real increase in spending since budget 2017. And far off from being just a one-off, uh, that shift to a culture of financial and fiscal discipline will remain permanent. And it's pretty simple, because families, farmers and businesses have all had to adjust and tighten their belts, and it's only right that government does the same thing. And while we have a lot more work to do, a lot more work to do to rebuild our economy, and the economic outlook is incredibly challenging at the moment, the budget forecasts include some, I think, encouraging signs. And the first is that inflation is coming down fast. It's now down to 4%, down from 7% not that long ago. We have food inflation, which has now collapsed to less than 1%, down from over 12% a year ago. Interest rates, as you all know in this room, and as I've been talking to folk today, remain high, but they at least have peaked. Uh, and business confidence is well off the lows of 2022 and 23, showing that while times are tough, there is some people being able to see through that noise to a place of more optimism. And the current account deficit, which was amongst the worst in the developed world, has now narrowed with oil prices coming down and we are selling more offshore. So with inflation expected to fall to below 3% by the end of the year, and then following that, interest rates coming down, uh, I think as hard as it is right now, there is at least some light at the end of the recessionary tunnel. Green shoots, I think, are starting, just starting to take hold. This budget was also, however, about setting the foundations for growth for the rest of the decade and beyond. And arguably the most shocking numbers in the budget weren't the huge spending increases or the massive debts uh, which we have accumulated in recent years. The most shocking number actually was about economic productivity. Because Treasury's advice shows it's been no observable growth in this country's productivity for around a decade. And frankly, that's not good enough. The only way for us all collectively to achieve better living standards and higher incomes is by building a much more productive economy. And that requires more innovation, investment, and a willingness to take risks and to get out there and compete with the very best in the world. And that's why I am, that's why our government is laser focused on rebuilding the economy and why we are working so hard to deliver on our plan to do exactly that. I think the previous government got the formula wrong. They thought that they could spend and regulate their way to prosperity, and it took just six years to prove that wrong. Prosperity comes not from higher taxes and more public spending, but it comes from investment and from trade and from specialisation and from high-quality public services, especially education. So we have to build much deeper links to other countries to expand our opportunities for trade, and to be much, much more open to investment if we are to lift this country's economic productivity. And so that's what we're excited about. Yes, we have a short-term job to deal with inflation and get the cost of living uh, under control and get interest rates down, but the exciting agenda is actually how we grow New Zealand's future uh, and create more economic prosperity. And we'll do that by focusing on five things. Firstly, building a world-class education system. Secondly, embracing science, technology, innovation. Third, we have to build out modern, reliable infrastructure that has economic, social and environmental benefits. 
We need to make sure we get rid of the red tape and, and, and get more competition, and you would have seen some of the announcements that we've made in recent times around that. And fifthly, we need to make sure we get out in the world and strengthen our international connections uh, with the places that we sell our products to. So since we came to office in November, there has been a steady march of reforms designed, frankly, to unshackle business, to reduce inflation, and to create the conditions for future growth. We're giving the businesses confidence to hire by restoring 90-day trials and cancelling the compulsory union bargaining approach. We're dismantling the obstruction economy, introducing fast-track rules to accelerate investment and charting out a course of systematic RMA reform. We're delivering on water reforms to put assets back into community ownership and control, but also create the financial freedom for local councils to make critical infrastructure investments. And we are ending the war on farmers by slashing through the jungle of red and green tape so they can actually focus on their businesses and growing their farm gate profits. As a government, it is our responsibility to create the foundations for growth that will get this country through the turbulent period with great confidence. And my envision is that by the time we get to 2040, we have built one of the leading advanced small countries on earth, period. And that would be characterised by three things. A very dynamic and productive economy with much higher living standards. Public services really delivered through the lens of social investment where funding is devolved to communities so Kiwis can achieve their greatest potential. And finally, a comprehensive response to climate change, both on emissions targets and also resilience. And I have to say, six months into this job, I feel incredibly optimistic about the future for New Zealand. And I know it's tough at the moment, but I actually see that we have huge opportunities. We are bang smack in the middle of the Indo-Pacific region. We have incredibly talented people. We have abundant natural resources. We have strong public institutions. And we have a modern multicultural country built on a strong bicultural foundations. And all of those ingredients say that there should be no excuses for why we can't do exceptionally well for ourselves in the years and the decades ahead. Now, the government has set an aspirational target to double the value of exports in 10 years. But to achieve that, we're going to need to play to our strengths, which starts with us understanding our comparative advantage and where that sits. And of course, our comparative advantage is in food and fibre. Last year, just to ground you in some facts, food and fibre earned $57 billion in export revenues, about 82% of all our goods exported out of New Zealand. And so clearly the primary sector is going to have to play an absolutely crucial role to help us double the value of exports in the next 10 years. Now the previous government, I think, treated the primary sector as if it was a problem to be solved and declared war on farmers by burying the sector in lots of red tape. This government believes that our path to prosperity demand, depends on building on, upon our strengths and not burdening our most productive export sectors with needless and unhelpful regulations. So things have changed. Under this government, New Zealand, as I keep saying, is open for business. And frankly, we don't have a choice. To lift our standard of living, our quality of living, we must be humble enough to know that we have to compete more for talent and for capital, and we must be bold enough to believe that we can win and we will. New Zealand's great strength is in our primary sector, and our farms, our forests, our horticulture and our aquaculture are all truly world class. And as a country, our future depends on embracing those strengths. So we see three areas which we think can have the greatest potential to lift the primary production and productivity. And the first is in the area of water storage, where we want to eliminate barriers to investment in water storage, which we think will improve resilience and make the best use of precious water resources. The second area which we talk a lot about is actually making sure we have modern, reliable infrastructure. And that means removing the barriers to investment in things like port upgrades and the domestic processing of raw materials. And the final area which I've touched on a little bit is around trade, which is about us building deeper connections with other countries so that our producers can reach millions more consumers. And of course, regulation has its place, but regulation should be targeted, they should be smart, they should be proportional, and importantly, they should work. And so the government's goal is to reduce the duplication, the red tape and regulatory blockages that are preventing investment in irrigation, in water storage, in flood protection schemes and stock exclusion. Now, it is important to reconcile our growth ambitions with our commitments to the environment, and New Zealand must maintain its sustainability credentials to future-proof our export-led growth. And so the government is deeply committed to our climate change goals, including net zero by 2050. And we must bring down agricultural emissions. But we should also celebrate and sell the fact that New Zealand already has the world's most carbon efficient farmers. 
It simply doesn't make sense to close down New Zealand farms only to send that production offshore and raise global emissions in less carbon efficient places. And we're not going to do that and we don't need to do that. Our emission strategy should be based not on less production but certainly on lower emissions per unit of output. And so our path to lower agricultural emissions, quite frankly, sits with technology. We can produce and sell more food and fibre to the world and we can lower emissions by investing in and embracing new technologies. And so that's why in our budget, uh, 2024, we invested $400 million over four years to accelerate the commercialisation of tools and technologies to reduce on-farm emissions. And this included a $51 million investment in the New Zealand Agricultural Greenhouse Gas Research Centre to fund various projects, including the development of a methane vaccine, low emissions rye grass, a slow release methane inhibiting bolus, and various methane reducing probiotics. We're also committed, as you know, to liberalising our laws uh, around genetic engineering and the development of a new GE regulator is already underway. The government is investing in a technology-led approach. That means that farmers are going to have the tools and the technology that they need to lower emissions and also increase production. And as we confirmed yesterday, agriculture will remain outside the ETS and the pricing of agricultural emissions will begin no later than 2030. But that pricing will be set at a level that avoids leakage to other countries. We are not going to close New Zealand farms only to send jobs overseas and to potentially raise global emissions. Now the primary sectors have also had a difficult time over the past few years on several fronts, as you know too well. Since the election, an area that has emerged as a source of particular concern is rural banking. And farmers and others in the primary sector have told us that access to borrowing has become more difficult, that farmers are paying higher interest rates compared to other borrowers, and farmers have felt undue pressure at time from their banks. Reported satisfaction with banks among rural businesses has declined substantially in recent years, and these are significant concerns from a major sector, and I have to tell you the government is listening. So today I can announce that the government has asked the chairs of the Finance and Expenditure and Primary Production Committees to conduct a broad select committee inquiry into banking competition with an emphasis on rural banking. That inquiry will look at banking competition, it will look at customer service, and it will look at bank profitability. It will specifically include rural banking and, and cover the concerns which have been raised about competition, regulation, and consumer outcomes in rural areas for the last two years. The government has asked the committees to jointly develop the terms of reference, and the Finance and Expenditure Committee will lead the inquiry. Banking, I can tell you, plays, as you all know, a very important role in our communities, and the economy and competition and affordable and reliable access to lending is absolutely crucial for investment in the security of our rural businesses. It is absolutely essential that farmers and other primary sector businesses can have confidence that they can access credit on fair and good commercial terms. So let me say in closing that I think this country has unlimited potential and I appreciate that it is tough at the moment but our future I believe is incredibly bright. And I think the only question for all of us in this room is we, will we take the extraordinary opportunities that are now before us and look to convert them? The government, I think, has taken the first concrete steps to unlock future prosperity, acknowledging that there is a lot more for us to do. But New Zealand needs more trade. It needs a lot more investment. It needs more talent and better public services for us to lift our standard of living and our economic productivity. And so I think we must rediscover our mojo, as I've said so many before, our ambition, our aspiration, our celebration of excellence, our positivity and our growth mindset and our confidence to go out in the world and hustle and make things happen for ourselves. And I want to see a future world where we work in an adult-to-adult -adult way between the government and the primary sector, working together to realise every opportunity that this country has before it in order to grow and to create more prosperity. So can I say to all of you, thank you for what you do each and every day and for the contribution that you make to New Zealand and to our country. I hope you know that this sector is deeply valued and deeply appreciated by this government. And again, can I say thank you so much for listening to me today. Appreciate it.